rounds of final versions as um, my predecessor. So um, I, my topic is magical wands, and uh, I'm going to focus mostly on Jupiter and Saturn, and I really appreciate the opportunity to give this talk in honor of Don. He's been an inspiration through um, at least a great part of my career. So um, I have to point out that although Iowa was lucky enough to have Don on the faculty, UCLA borrowed him. In the late 70s, I think it was, um, Don spent a sabbatical leave at UCLA and uh, was much appreciated as a lecturer and a research colleague. And then in 2005, we brought, brought him back for our Slichter Lecture, which is a really big deal in our department, and he gave a wonderful talk. Um, uh, you can see we advertised it very extensively. And of course, parties followed. And here's one, uh, uh, a video done by somebody who had never done a video before. I think you'll enjoy it. Let's see if we can make it. You <laughs> well, you can't hear the conversation, but Don is telling a joke. And it's something in German. Uh, kuschen haben, or something like that. Yeah, I can't remember what the joke is, but Marie doesn't quite agree with him, and so she talks up at the end. So that's my video, and the good fun is evident, but I really wish I could, Don would repeat the joke for us sometime. Anyhow, that was, so the, <laughs> so the first time we worked together on a spacecraft project was the Galileo uh, mission to Jupiter, and we had to get along together. Oh, I don't, I haven't been using my, I, I keep forgetting that the pointer here doesn't show. So we had to uh, share this wonderful boom, and here are Don's antennas, and one of the magnetometers is right next to it here, second one down there, and it took a lot of cooperation to make sure that our instruments didn't interfere with each other, but I would say that that was carried out in the best spirit of scientific cooperation. So we, we knew we were up for something big. We were looking forward to reaching Jupiter with this big antenna to communicate the great distance over space to get the signal to Earth there had been a small antenna that was used in the initial phase of the mission when it would, we were going too close to the sun to, um, for the safety of the big antenna. And uh, the big antenna was supposed to be un opened up like an umbrella. Uh, here's the, the uh, artist's view of what it actually looked like and it was only the small antenna that could communicate to Earth. Our data rate went down by a factor of a thousand. But as my colleague Chris Russell says, in any power spectrum, there's more power at low frequencies than at high frequencies. The information at low frequency is really important. So we got some really good stuff, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about places where Don's work and mine um, uh, converged. So, uh, but, but uh, that's coming. I want to point out that Don has used this spectra of plasma waves as a magician might use magic wands to reveal secrets of planetary environments. And his wands have become weather stations, identifying lightning. They've become low energy particle detectors because you saw in Tom's talk, he can measure the density, the electron density. They're magnetometers. I'm going to show you an example of how he inferred 
the magnetic field of Ganymede. Uh, dust detectors, you saw something of that in Tom's talk, and life detectors. And you might, some of you may not know that he actually contributed to that subject. So let's uh, talk about how that happened. So en route to Jupiter, uh, the lift capability of the shuttle plus an upper stage rocket was insufficient to get Galileo to Jupiter in one uh, a, a direct uh, transit. So instead, uh, the spacecraft was launched from Earth. It was sent into Jupiter, uh, to Venus, where it got a gravitational assist. And then it came by Earth, got a second gra gravitational assist, went out into the asteroid belt, came back and got a next gravitational assist from Earth that put it on a direct flight to Jupiter. Well, that means there were two passes by Earth as if we were a spacecraft exploring another planet. And that turned out to have a lot of interesting, um, uh, uh, gave some interesting information. And Don, collaborating with Carl Sagan, asked himself if Galileo could answer the question, is there intelligent life on Earth? And it's an interesting thing to do. I mean, he, <laughs> you know, if we were an alien uh, race coming by Earth, how would we know that there's intelligent life on Earth? Well, there's some question, of course. But um, So here's Dawn's spectrum, and it's got a lot of natural. You heard about auroral kilometric radiation. There's lots of radiation, all natural. And then up here at the top, there's something funny going on, which is blown up here. And what you can see is uh, there's a tone that's remarkably steady. Notice these tones, natural tones, tend to change in frequency. This is remarkably steady. And so Don seized on that. Uh, he wasn't saying anything about what the signal was saying. He wasn't telling us whether the radio hosts we were looking for at were listening to were saying anything intelligent. But what, what he was doing uh, is described, and I have a quote here, in its December, uh, this is from the paper that they published in Nature. In its December 1995, 1990 flyby of Earth, the Galileo spacecraft found evidence of abundant gaseous oxygen, a widely distributed surface pigment with a sharp absorption edge in the red part of the visible spectrum. And of course, that's this red part here, and that's where chlorophyll is absorbing. Um, uh, an atmospheric methane and extreme thermodynamic disequilibrium. Together, these are strongly suggestive of life on Earth. But notice there's no adjective. Moreover, the presence of narrow band pulsed amplitude modulated radio transmission seems uniquely attributable to intelligence. These observations constitute a control experiment for the search for extraterrestrial life by modern interplanetary spacecraft. This is one of Don's papers that hasn't been mentioned that I like. Um, so dust detectors. Uh, so what, what Don noticed was, here's an example. This is not unique, but plasma wave instrument on Voyager 2 crossing Saturn's ring plane suddenly sees um, uh, this is frequency plotted versus time, and this is all different frequencies in that frequency analyzer. And it's, they're all uh, emitting at once in a rather narrow region. It was a characteristic signature over a broad frequency band, and Don was able to infer the size of the particles and um, uh, that they were producing impacts on the spacecraft. And uh, he has gone on to use uh, such signatures uh, in the Cassini mission um, as well. So let's next go to 
uh, the use of the magic wands to measure density and magnetic field. And here I have um, the D Don's electric field spectra and magnetic field spectra frequency versus time. As uh, Galileo flew by Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede, at that time we didn't know that it was the largest moon in the solar system because Titan tries to puff itself up with lots of atmosphere, but Ganymede is a larger solid body. And what he saw was, if you look at the electric field fluctuations, this uh, spectral band that seems to be very narrow comes to a maximum and then goes back down. Uh, that is an emission close to the electron plasma frequency. We heard about that earlier. It's proportional to the square root of the electron density. So Don was able to say, look, here we're in the background. There's nothing going on very much. And all of a sudden, we get near Ganymede, and this line goes way up and down. There must be an ionosphere at Ganymede. And uh, that was a really neat contribution. Um, then looking at the both magnetic and electric uh, oscillations, you can see that there's something going on below the uh, uh, plasma frequency, but is present in both the magnetic and the electric uh, spectra. Those are the famous electron Whistler mode waves. We know that they're confined to half the cyclotron frequency. The cyclotron frequency is proportional to uh, a bunch of stuff all, the only w thing of which we do not know is the magnetic field. So it's a direct measure of the magnetic field. So abracadabra, Ganymede has a magnetic field. And what Don also noticed was that there was a very abrupt transition into the region where he was seeing these trapped uh, radiation. He said, Ganymede has a magnetosphere. Now, the magnetometer was along for the ride and produced um, measurements of, uh, here I'm just, I'm showing the field magnitude and three components. And what you see is there's background, rather smooth and a sudden dip and a jump, and particularly in the component in the green, it, there's a rather sharp jump as we go out, and uh, so the, um, if, if you line up those jumps in the magnetic field measurements, they just follow where the jumps are occurring in the plasma measurements. Excellent agreement on the size of the magnetosphere that um, Ganymede carves out of the Jovian magnetic field. Here's a nice a uh, cartoon from Torrance Johnson that shows how Ganymede is surrounded by its own magnetic field, uh, magnetosphere uh, embedded in the magnetosphere of Jupiter. And uh, in Nature, we had side-by-side -side articles, discovery of the magnetic field evidence for a magnetosphere. So that was a fun joint undertaking. Um, so why is all of that interesting? Um, uh, one of the things that's interesting about it is that Ganymede is the only moon in the magnetosphere in the solar system that has a magnetic field. It is the biggest, but nobody predicted that there would be molten material in the interior of Ganymede that would be capable of driving a planetary magnetic field. Uh, gravitational measurements can be used to make a model of the interior with a, an exterior ice surface, uh, a, a rocky mantle, and a metallic core. But the difference in density between solid and liquid metal is insignificant. And uh, gravitational measurements can't say anything about this the state of the material in the interior. So 
This measurement of a magnetic field at Ganymede really changed the view of how planetary interiors evolve. A lot of people tried to argue, oh, there must have been a heating uh, episode uh, sometime uh, in the last billion years. This, this is not the cooling from the original formation four and a half billion years ago. But I actually question whether we understand thermal evolution. Every time we find a new body, it's doing something thermally that's different from what we expected. Enceladus, the small moon of Saturn, is spewing out water-related products from an internal ocean. I don't believe we really understand the thermal evolution of, of Enceladus. If you've, ever, if you've taken a look at the pictures of Pluto, I don't think we understand the thermal evolution of Pluto. So I think this was sort of a first step on showing us, once again, how ignorant we are. That's good. I mean, that's the purpose of doing exploration, is to understand better what we don't know. So there's something else that's fun about it from the point of view of plasma science, and that is this magnetosphere is unique. It forms in a flowing plasma that is flowing very slowly compared to the rate at which in information propagates through the plasma. Uh, the relevant velocity is what we call the Alfane velocity, and we're go uh, the flow in which Ganymede is embedded is slow compared with the Alfane velocity. That means that the magnetosphere of Ganymede has some very unique uh, uh, properties compared with planetary magnetospheres. The size of the magnetosphere depends on the nature of the upstream flow, how dense, how fast it's flowing, and the strength of the magnetic field. But the shape uh, depends to be a low order on the the relative size of the flow velocity, which I call u, and the alphane velocity, va. So it, at, um, uh, at um, Ganymede, the flow is very slow. And so what happens, I'm going to blow this up a little bit so you can see a little bit better what's going on. The flow is coming along. It encounters some disturbances just upstream of Ganymede and starts trying to change its flow pattern. But as it changes its flow pattern, it's responding to the fact that the signal that's trying to go up the field to tell it to move differently is being swept downstream. And Ganymede's uh, magnetosphere forms what we call alphane wings. And that's because the flow this way is very slow the information goes up very slowly, and uh, the flow, uh, I mean, the information goes up at rapidly, and the flow goes up slowly, so it bends back a little. Uh, and behind those lines that I've drawn, you'll see that there are changes in the flow pattern, as well as in the magnetic field and the density. Now, let's compare that with uh, the magnetosphere of Earth, where the flow is very fast compared with the rate at which uh, signals can propagate, for example, uh, along the magnetic field. And so the fast flow bends the lobes. Just think of taking these lobes and just pushing them down toward the center by blowing very quickly over the top and bottom. I pulled out an old, um, oh, this does work. No. Yes, it does work. I pulled out an old um, uh, 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 schematic, uh, which I noticed has a, a kink in the field here, and then the kink goes away completely. So I'm going to improve it by showing you what really happens, and I, that the kink goes away relatively slowly, and in fact develops an inverted sense in the part of the magnetopause that is open to the solar wind. 
it's very similar to what's going on here, except for the relative flow rates. So it, it, Ganymede is a magnetosphere that, um, uh, that, that didn't get quite as folded over as planetary magnetospheres. Now there's another fun thing that's happening at, at Ganymede's mag magnetosphere, and that is that just as we go into the jump, this is the field magnitude versus time in the uh, transit by the moon for three different passes by the moon. Gal Galileo uh, numbered the passes according to the orbit it, on which they took place. And you see that just before you go into the magnetosphere, there are waves each time, some of them bigger, some of them smaller, but waves each time. Uh, initially, we thought they were a kind of wave called Kelvin-Helmholtz waves, but we're, we decided to look at simulations to see how we could account for these waves on the boundary of the magnetopause. And um, we were asking the question then, are they waves or are they evidence of bursty reconnection? So uh, doing a simulation of Ganymede is, has some real challenges for the simulator. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of them, but I am going to take a minute to talk about the importance of internal boundary conditions. A lot of people forget that differential equations have non-unique solutions until you establish the boundary conditions, and so it's really important to get them right. Uh, so uh, we um, uh, tried to simulate this system, I'll go show you something about those internal boundary conditions, but um, I just want to say that the simulation was able to re reproduce the amplitude and the frequency of the fluctuations in the simulation. And f in the simulation, it, what's producing these wave-like disturbances is recurrent bursty reconnection at intervals of less than about 10 seconds. And it's interesting that at Mercury, Mes Messenger has found similar very short repetition rates in a situation where the uh, alphane Mach number is rather small, mu cl uh, the closest uh, that any of the planetary magnetospheres come to the situation at Ganymede. So let me just talk, talk a, a bit about the internal boundary conditions. Uh, the first thing we tried was to say, well, look, you've got this body in the flow. The flow should stop at the surface. And we ran the simulation that way and found flows that were going in directions that were completely inconsistent with observations. So we said, oh, you know, we got that wrong. It's the radial component of the flow that goes to zero. It can go tangential to the surface. And we ran that one. And again, we got flows that were going very fast away from the uh, poles. This is it, these plots are in a plane where the magnetic field is southward and the flow is to the right. Uh, again, that was wrong. So then we tried a third idea, which was based on physics. The tangential electric field should be continuous as you reach the, the surface of the body. And all of a sudden, the flows looked very much like what we expected. They went over the polar cap smoothly. They went into the wake. There was reconnection in the wake. So part of the flow went on to the right and part returned to the upstream, just what you really needed. Uh, I thought it was a very useful uh, bit of evidence that uh, you have to be sure you're working with the right boundary conditions. Here's one more thing we found. We found that the magnetopause position varied depending upon which of the boundary conditions we use. So this is the, uh, a plot of uh, the uh, uh, north-south component of the field, which is northward inside the mag uh, magnetosphere of Jupiter, southward outside, 
and this is the magnetopause for the two different boundary conditions, and they're off by about 10%, so it really does make a difference. Uh, but with the physically good boundary conditions, this simulation did reproduce quite well all of the measurements that had been made of the plasma properties, the field properties, and in particular, the open-closed boundary was found to line up with an aurora that, is, uh, that has been measured by Hubble. So a uh, very useful approach. Now, the other place where Don's work has been the basis of uh, my, uh, my own investigations has been at Saturn, where Don discovered uh, properties of the, what we, it's called Saturn kilometric radiation. You've heard about it a couple of times. Uh, that it, um, it is not completely steady in frequency or period, whichever you prefer to think about. It drifts, so it's not really the rotation period of the deep interior of a massive planet that is not going to change in years. Um, and he also discovered that there were separate sources, north and south, at slightly different frequencies. All of these things are extremely interesting and very hard to understand. But I'm introducing Saturn with this picture because I think it's one of the most wonderful images that uh, has appeared in our field. It's taken at equinox. There is no solar illumination on the rings because the sun's light is coming in uh, exactly in the plane of the rings. So no solar illumination. It's, they're being illuminated by backscattered light from Saturn itself. Uh, you follow this ring around and you'll see, you can see right through it as you get around towards Saturn. These rings have thicknesses of only a few meters, even though they're hundreds of thousands of kilometers in horizontal extent. And uh, the thing that I think is particularly fun is that you see the shadow of the rings as this slightly darkened line. So, so thin, you'd almost miss it. I just love that image, so I use it even though it has nothing to do with my talk. <laughs> okay, periodicities, periodic radio signals, but Saturn hides its period. So Saturn's magnetic moment is aligned with its spin axis to better than one degree. And that means none of the electromagnetic variations that we see can really be attributed to wobbling dipoles. So maybe the radi radiation isn't modeled, but of, uh, modulated, but of course it was, we've been surprised. The planetary dipole moment, despite the fact that it's so closely aligned, the electromagnetic power is modulated at Saturn's rotation period. And you've already seen this slide, and I think you're going to see it again. Um, it's a really nice, I'm going to let it blow up so you can see it a little bit better. And these arrows are separated by 10.7 hours, and what you see is the power increases uh, and decreases, increases, and decreases. There's this nice um, cartoon that Dawn made showing that the power is coming from a radio source someplace in the south for this particular emission. And as that uh, region that's emitting the, the signal rotates, it gets stronger and weaker. And uh, the um, uh, this, I think, this concept has uh, been supported very well, that there's a rotating source that intensifies as it moves into the morning sector. Um, also, the auroral hiss is modulated at the same period, and the magnetosphere changes size and shape at the same period. Magnetic field perturbations inside of about 12 uh, Saturn radii near the equator rotate at the same period. Uh, and so, and uh, then of course I 
mentioned already that the period, this is the southern period. Don likes to talk about rotation rate, but he's very kind to those of us who like to talk about period by giving both labels. Of course, this is versus time in years from 2004 to 2011. And what you can see is that the radiation is emitted at a frequency that drifts. That's, it's as if Earth's day kept changing. Uh, uh, it's not the internal rotation of the planet. And that there's a second uh, source in the north that ha is at a slightly different period. So um, there's the northern signal, there's the southern signal. This is the inferred internal rotation signal uh, inferred from dynamical arguments by Anderson and Schubert. It's shorter than either of those uh, observed periods, and it's also not universally accepted as the right internal rotation period. But in order to explain the magnetic signature at, uh, near the equator, the, that is very well documented, uh, there must be a system of currents flowing outside of, of Saturn. Saturn is the little golden ball in the center, and this is at about 12 er, uh, Saturn radii uh, away at the equator. There are, must be field-aligned currents coming up from one ionosphere into the opposite ionosphere, cross it back down again, and the whole system in rotation at the SKR period. That can account for the magnetic perturbations observed near the equator. And uh, Southwood and I put this idea forward. And then a few years later, working with Shinja Jha at University of Michigan, we decided to have him run a, an MHD simulation in which he imposed currents of the sort that we had d discussed from one ionosphere to the other and back down again and set them into rotation to see if you could account for the other properties that are periodic, like the ones Tom talked about, the uh, variations in particle fluxes. So here I'm going to show you the whole pattern rotates, the color is the density, and this is what happens to the magnetosphere in a steady solar wind. You'll notice in the, the, the solar wind, um, I forget, this is density, nothing changes in the upstream. It's just the rotating current system. And look at what it's doing. It's stretching the, what we call this the tail current sheet. It's making it move up and down. It's, um, uh, it's, it's changing the whole field geometry. It's pushing the magnetopause out and in. It's pushing the bow shock out and in. Uh, very different from what we're used to at Earth. Uh, so the magnetosphere breathes in and out and rocks up and down. And here's a set of plots, that uh, movie, that shows you um, compressional waves propagating through the magnetosphere. What we've plotted here is the difference between the pr total pressure at a point um, uh, at one time step and the next. And what you can see is that there are, I'm going to do that again. Whoops, let's go back. Uh, what you can see is that there are pressure waves generated just by this rotating system of currents deep inside, pushing the magnetopause out. It's, it's really quite a remarkable uh, explanation of really a very large number of observations. Now, to me, the most interesting thing is why should there be this current system? And you can drive a current system of the sort that we have described by having vertical flow in the ionosphere. And so we, we have actually, that's actually how we generate it the field aligned currents in the simulation. We set up vortical flows and put them into the, the whole pattern into rotation at a prescribed period. Now what would drive the vortical flows? 
Well, they could be driven from the magnetosphere. Um, there are theories of that, but to me the problem with that explanation is that the solar wind is not steady, and when a, an interplanetary shock hits the magnetosphere, it becomes very, very disturbed. And yet, the, these periodic variations come back to the same phase. Not, uh, it's easy to have them come back to the same period, but they come back to the same period at the same phase. And that's hard to explain. Uh, if they're driven from below the ionosphere in a region of the atmosphere that has a high inertia, then you could account for, for having uh, them come back to the same phase. But it's a re it would have to be driven in a region of the atmosphere between the cloud chops that we image and the ionosphere that we probe. And we don't have any data. Uh, the, uh, um, the last thing I'm going to show you is a rather cute idea that David Southwood has come up with where he suggests that a rotating polar cap connected to open field lines is constantly transmitting angular momentum to the solar wind. And he has shown theoretically that you cannot transport angular momentum in a completely symmetric system. And that requires then that the system become unstable. And I'm going to show you how, his, how this works in a simulation. So again, the simulation, we start with a conducting plate and a uniform field. And then we start just the central disk rotating. And it begins to twist up the field lines. And then the field lines get twisted up and eventually they start rocking. And you will see, okay, let's see, I need to get the, I, I, oh dear. Okay, I, I wanted to do it a couple of times so that you could see the, uh, you could see the um, uh, pressure pulses, you can see it gets a little bit lighter in here. Those are the pressure pulses going out. Then the simulation breaks down. But it's, it's, we're working on a better simulation. But it, 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 this kind of thing could actually drive the periodicity. It still has the problem of how you maintain a phase. Anyhow, that's, uh, uh, all of that work was inspired by Don's discovery. So at this point, a summary is in order. And I can't summarize it because Don's contributions, even in the limited areas of this talk, are too, mu too many to go through. Uh, but it's uh, quite clear that in much of our understanding of planetary magnetospheres, at the bottom is something that Don has taught us. And that's all based on a remarkably comprehensive understanding of plasmas and plasma waves. So thank you for inviting me and hooray for Don. Well, that's would an. Well, you know, it's a good question, and it's one that has been discussed. Uh, the reversals tend to take about 10,000 years, and happen on the average uh, about every 200 million years. Uh, it's really, it's not a frequent occurrence. So uh, the question is not quite clear 
whether the magnetic field becomes so small that we would be exposed to cosmic rays and all the uh, associated things we're protected from by our magnetic field, or whether it merely becomes smaller than normal. It, it may, uh, in fact, rotate from pointing one way to pointing another, and that would change the distribution of the parts of the Earth that are directly open to the solar wind, but it would leave large parts of the Earth protected. So we, we still have a lot to learn. I, I think you're right. It's, uh, I mean, if the magnetic field disappeared completely, uh, the environment would be uh, rather uh, worrisome. constitutes the dust that you were looking for and how, what did you know ahead of time in order to design the detector to look for it? Well, of course, uh, <laughs> Don's detector was designed to look for what was there and so I don't think you did any special designing. Okay. Thank you. But Voyager was after the uh, other way around. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Jacobi, wasn't Jacobini Zimmer at the same time as, as um, Halley's Comet? No, a year before Yeah, and that's 76, isn't it? Yeah, uh, 85. 85. I, I don't believe the signals that were interpreted on IC3 were understood until after the Voyager 2 encounter, where we understood that we were actually susceptible to the detection of dust. Oh, that's okay. interesting. I wrote a paper on that. <laughs> 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 I think we should probably yeah, go to our next uh, talk. Well, let's thank our speaker one more time.